Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman, and today we're going to be talking about the symbolic acts in Jeremiah. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for opportunity that we can come together to study your word. We pray that you will bless us this evening as we study the symbolic acts in the Bible. Guide us and bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that said, uh, we are ready to begin tonight's program. So this week we're studying the symbolic acts in the book of Jeremiah, um, but also looking at a few other instances in other places in the Bible. We're going to go to our uh, main memory text, which is Romans chapter 9 and, uh, and verse 21. So let's begin with that. Romans 9 verse 21, which says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So the Bible is filled with symbols. It has symbols uh, all throughout from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, symbols are basically things that represent concepts or ideas other than what they are at face value. So the entire Jewish economy, the whole sanctuary system, everything in it was symbolic about something that would happen in the future or in the, in the ministry of Christ uh, for the salvation of souls. So everything in the Jewish economy and the, and the, the, um, the sanctuary system was symbolic of something in the plan of salvation. Uh, so these symbols ultimately pointed to Christ and were like little mini prophecies that showed uh, coming events that would happen as a result of Christ's ministry. Uh, so they basically foreshadowed things that were to come. Now, God put these symbols in place as teaching tools. He used them uh, to teach humanity the, pro by the process by which he would save them and what ultimately he planned to do for them. Uh, so much of what we read in the Bible is, in fact, symbolic. Uh, God uses symbols to teach humanity um, very important things, important concepts. Uh, prophecy, for example, is made up of, largely of symbols. If you look at the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation, you'll see tons of symbols. Uh, when you look at uh, Daniel, for example, in chapter 2, you see, these, uh, you see this, uh, this, this image that is made up of different metals, and each metal was symbolic of a different nation. Uh, when you looked at Daniel chapter 7, you saw animals that represented the same nations as the metals in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, so throughout the Bible and throughout prophecy especially, you'll find um, symbols that represent much larger concepts. Jesus' parables also contain symbols, and he used them to convey and to explain important truths. So, for example, the ten virgins uh, were not ten literal virgins, but were representative of something. Um, the the, the the prodigal son was representative of humanity and how uh, humanity is lost. It's, sorry, it's the one son that's lost, um, but God, who is the father, ultimately comes and, uh, to save him and welcome him back into the fold. Um, you have the parable of the lost sheep, uh, which is very similar to the prodigal son, whereas the prodigal son was lost, uh, the sheep was lost, and the shepherd goes out to find the sheep. Uh, it leaves the 99 other sheep to go and find the one that was lost. So throughout the Bible, uh, we have different symbols that are used to illustrate things about the plan of salvation and about God's character and his love. Um, now, we don't fully comprehend and understand everything that these symbols have to teach us, even now. Um, we don't know all the possible lessons that could be learned from all these symbolic um, instruments within the Bible. However, what we do know is that the gospel is the key to unlocking many of the mysteries behind these symbols uh, that we find in Scripture. So much of the, the book of Jeremiah contains symbols, and we, we will explore some of those symbols tonight. Uh, but first I want to look at, at a few Old Testament examples that are not in the book of Jeremiah. So symbols are basically used throughout the Old Testament, especially in the book of Genesis. But let's make a few things clear. Uh, some deny that the creation account is actually history. And so when they look at the creation account, they try to say that the creation account itself is all symbolic. So they're basically suggesting that, the, that God did not create the world in six literal days or that, um, you know, things did not happen exactly the way that they said they did in the book of Genesis. But the fact that the Bible shows us that Jesus regarded the creation account as history. King David is another example of someone who regarded the, the creation account as as history. So many of the Old Testament figures all seem to um, accept the Genesis account as history, 
And therefore, I would make the case that we should too. So even though some try to deny the creation account, uh, the Bible teaches that the creation account is, in fact, history. It actually took place, uh, God created the world in six literal days, and he rested on a literal seventh day, and he blessed the seventh day, and it became what we now know as the Sabbath. Uh, and the Sabbath is a weekly creation memorial, which was and still is uh, God's celebration of what he did in six literal days. And it's to be celebrated weekly. So in spite of the fact that many people in, in the secular world and, uh, and even some scholars tried to say that the creation account is not literal, uh, the Bible records it as historical fact. Jesus believed it as historical fact. And so I believe that we should too. Um, people's lives in the Old Testament were often symbols of much greater concepts later on. So even though the creation account is literal and is actual factual history, uh, there were things that were symbolic in the Old Testament. Um, people's lives, for example, were used as symbols of greater things later on, uh, either to point to Christ or aspects of Christ's ministry or um, as symbols of, of, of principles that Christians should follow or not follow. Um, one such example of that is with Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 to 7. Let's take a look at that really quickly so you can get an idea of what I mean by symbols. Now, Cain and Abel were literal people. They were real people that existed. Uh, they were the sons of Adam and Eve. But even though they were real people, what happened in their lives in this account was symbolic of a much larger and greater picture that humanity uh, can benefit from in, uh, in understanding today. Let's take a look at that. So we're starting at verse 3. And it says, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first fruits of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, in other words, angry. Uh, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain, uh, and then later on we find that Cain talks with his brother Abel and slays him out of jealousy for the fact that God had accepted his offering while rejecting Cain's. So, in what way does this story symbolize something much greater than what the story suggests at face value. Now, the reason why I ask that question is because this is an actual event that took place in history. There was a Cain, there was an Abel. Cain did slay Abel um, out of jealousy for God accepting his gifts. But yet, these two characters in the Bible are symbolic of something else. So real people or real events can be symbolic of something much greater outside of themselves. Well, if we take a look, we find that Abel's sacrifice was of the first fruits of his flock. So in other words, he sacrificed an animal. Uh, he made a blood sacrifice, um, which God accepted. Now, why is it that God had accepted this blood sacrifice, whereas when Cain worked hard to, to uh, produce the, the fruit of the ground, um, he rejected it? We find in Scripture that Abel's sacrifice represents death and the atoning blood of Christ. So Abel had to first slay an animal, which represented the death, and then through the blood of that animal, God accepted his gift and had respect unto Abel's, uh, Abel's offering. Uh, so this symbolized basically that um, one day somebody would be slain in the place of humanity. So the death of the animal represented the death of Christ, which would come many years after this, this incident. Um, and the, the blood of that animal represented the atoning blood of Christ. So Cain offered a sacrifice that illustrated the very process through which God would use uh, to save humanity. Uh, the death of the animal representing the death of Christ. The blood of the animal rep representing the atoning blood, which substitutes for the blood of humanity. All right, so the atoning blood of Christ. So because of this, 
um, Cain was able to demonstrate through his offering righteousness, which comes by faith. Because he had faith that one day God would send an atoning sacrifice. And through the death of this sacrifice, and through the, uh, the atoning blood of this sacrifice, humanity would have life. And so God had respect unto Cain's offering because it fully represented what God was going to do on man's behalf in the future. And so uh, basically Abel's sacrifice, or offering rather, represented righteousness by faith. On the other hand, Cain worked hard and he produced a bunch of crops from the ground because he was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer, basically. And he offered to God the first fruits of all his work his hard labor, his hard effort, his work. But these were not what God wanted and not what God was looking for. So the animal was actually the proper symbol of what demonstrated faith of something out, sorry, faith in something outside of oneself. Uh, faith in what was outside of what man was able to provide through his hard work and through his effort. A life which atoned for the life of humanity. Abel's offering showed that it was only by the merits of Christ that man could be saved, whereas Cain just gave God a um, outpouring of his hard work. But God didn't want Cain's hard work. There's no amount of hard work that Cain could have done that would have atoned for the mistakes and for the sins of humanity. And so God wasn't looking for hard work. It wasn't that Cain... Um, didn't work hard or didn't, uh, you know, want to give God something that uh, was good, but that his sacrifice was not illustrative of what God was, was, was seeking to accomplish for the human race. And so God rejected his gift and said that, that Cain had not done well in offering this kind of gift. God was not hungry. God doesn't need the crops of the ground. Uh, you know, God doesn't need our finances or our money. Um, God is more important. Sorry, God is more uh, interested in us getting the point and and Abel's offering showed that he got the point whereas Cain's hard work and effort showed that he missed the point so even if Cain's sacrifice was as sincere as it could possibly be Cain missed the mark in offering uh the fruit of his hard work and labor and not offering something that was illustrative of the plan of salvation so the first question that I want to throw out to you, we see here how Abel's sacrifice represents righteousness by faith and Cain's sacrifice represents righteousness by works. Okay. Cain wanted to work hard and give something and give God something that was representative of his hard work. Abel gave something that was representative of what God was going to do on behalf of man that man could not provide for himself. So Abel was righteousness by faith. Cain was righteousness by works. The question that I want to throw out to you, why is it that God could not accept hard work if it was offered in sincerity? What was the problem with hard work? What are your thoughts? Okay. Well, um, well the problem with Cain's sacrifice, no, it's not that it was hard work, but that it was not what God required. Mm -hmm. God required a spotless lamb. And because uh, Cain didn't bring a spotless lamb, he didn't do what God required. And because he didn't trust, well, if he would have brought a lamb, a spotless lamb, it would have, uh, it would have, he would have, uh, he would have trusted in the Redeemer, the sacrifice of Jesus, that Jesus was going to make. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do that, and so he, it wasn't that hard, God doesn't accept hard work. He accepts hard work, but he didn't trust in the sacrifice. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you bring out. Um, in this instance, God was not looking for Cain's hard work. He needed a particular gift um, that was representative of the understanding uh, of how God was going to save humanity and what God was going to do on man's behalf. So a sacrifice of Cain's hard work was not conducive to the understanding that God wanted man to have. Um, so it's not so much that God doesn't appreciate hard work ever, but that in this instance, it was more important to illustrate 
what hard work God was going to do in the place of man. Man could not play, uh, could not pay the penalty uh, of sin and could not pay the cost, the high cost of, of what sin uh, really ultimately um, what was going to cost God. And so it was more important. See, Cain could have actually asked Abel and gotten a, uh, some kind of some kind of um, uh, lamb or, or, or animal from from Abel's flock. But instead of doing that, Cain wanted to give something that was from him. So Cain wasn't a person who took care of the flock. Abel really was the one who did that. Cain was a tiller of the ground. But rather than uh, go to his brother and say, you know, can I have one of your, your sheep or can I have, you know, this animal so that I can have something to offer to God, um, he doesn't do that. He wants to offer something that's ultimately from him. Um, and, and when we try to offer things that are only from us to God, uh, we're likely to get the same response. It's going to be rejected because ultimately, and, and, and here's the context in which I'm speaking, ultimately, it's only by the blood of Christ that we can approach God. If we try to approach God with our own works and with our own righteousness, we're going to fail every time because there's nothing that we can offer God. But when we approach him with the blood of Jesus, then we can be accepted. So God can only be approached through the merits of Christ and not the works that we try to offer him ourselves. Now, the flip side of that, uh, let me just make clear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that when you do things for God that God never appreciates it. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying, uh, what, I, what I am saying is that when you're trying to approach God, you have to approach him through the merits of Christ. Because if you approach him in your own righteousness, your own righteousness is as filthy rags. You don't have the righteousness required uh, to approach God. All right? God is holy. And so only that which is holy can come into God's presence. And so we need something outside of ourselves to give us access to the Father. And that something, or someone rather, is Jesus Christ. Um, another way in which this was illustrated is actually in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4, uh, verses four, to, 4 to 9. So we're going to go to the book of Numbers, and uh, chapter 21, and we're going to start at verse 4. Which says, And they journeyed from the Mount uh, from Mount Or, by the way of the Red Sea, to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of the land of Egypt, to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the, the, the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So here we see another example of a symbol. God tells Moses to put a fiery bronze serpent or brass serpent on a pole, lift it up, and anybody who looks at this serpent uh, that's on this pole, this brass serpent, would live. And uh, actually, this same symbol is used today uh, in the medicine and health and nursing professions. Uh, so when you see uh, kind of like a pole with uh, the, the serpents twirling around it, that's the, uh, that, that ultimately came from um, this incident, this story in the Bible, where people only had to look to that raised up serpent, on, uh, that brass raised up serpent, and they would, they would be healed of whatever diseases uh, that they may have had. So the same symbol is actually used in medicine today. But the question then becomes, what did this symbol really mean? Why did God uh, give them, why did God tell Moses to make a brass serpent, put it on a pole, and have it raised up? just to heal these people. What purpose did this symbol serve? And, and what exactly did the symbol mean? What are your thoughts? I gather that uh, no one's really sure as to what exactly it means. All right, so remember that, um, and you get this later on in scripture too. I'm actually gonna give you the text first, but then we're gonna break, break down uh, the scripture in Numbers chapter 21 uh, as well. But let me give you the other text first. Uh, we're gonna go to John chapter three and verse 14. 
it says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. So here we see that the serpent represented Christ. Um, just as the serpent had to be lifted up, so the son of man, who is Jesus Christ, had to be lifted up. Um, and anyone who looked to the serpent uh, would have life. Anyone who looks to the Son of Man, who, who believes on him, will have life. So you see the, the comparison there and how ultimately the serpent uh, represents Christ, who is also lifted up. Uh, but I want to take it a step further. See, we've established that Christ had to be lifted up as our sin bearer in order for us to be saved. So Christ, um, you'll, no, you'll notice that a serpent in Scripture typically represents Satan or the devil or represents sin. Um, you see that, for example, in Revelation chapter 12, where uh, it talks about the great dragon, uh, which represents uh, that old Satan, uh, sorry, that old uh, serpent called the devil and Satan. So serpents typically represent sin. The color brass in the Old Testament tended to represent uh, sacrifice. So brass or bronze was the color of sacrifice. So you have this brass serpent that's lifted up, which represents the sacrifice uh, and sin. So the serpent representing sin and uh, brass representing uh, the color of, of sacrifice. And it's lifted up on this pole. Now, what do these three things have in common? You have a serpent, which usually is a, represent, a representation of sin or of Satan. And then you have uh, the, color of sac uh, the color of sacrifice being used. And then you have this pole. Well, when Jesus was lifted up on the cross, he took on the sins of humanity. So he paid the penalty for all the of humanity he took on sin onto himself and that's why the bible calls him our sin bearer so that explains why the, the symbolism of a serpent is used to represent christ in this instance because he's taking on the sins of the world um onto himself he is the sin bearer and um uh, because he sacrificed himself for us remember jesus said nobody takes my life from me i lay it down of myself i have power to lay it down and i have power to take it up again so in order for Jesus to die, he sacrificed himself, all right, on behalf of humanity. So um, <clears throat> in addition to that, he was lifted up, just as the serpent was lifted up on a pole, Jesus was lifted up on a wooden cross. So these things show us that the serpent, the bronze serpent, represented Jesus being sacrificed as our sin bearer and taking on the sins of humanity so that we can have life. And anybody who looks to Jesus, just as any person who looked to that uh, bronze serpent, uh, would be saved and would be healed and cured of any diseases or ailments that they might have had. So in order to be saved, one had to believe God's word through Moses. They had to trust and have faith in the provided means that God had given them for recovery. Because if they doubted that looking to the bronze serpent would work, and they chose not to look, they would be lost. They would, be, they would die uh, as a result of the snake bites. So they had to believe what Moses said, and trust that it was actually true, and then take action on what they claimed or professed to believe. So it wasn't enough to just say, okay, we believe that if we look at the serpent, we'll be, we'll be healed. They had to believe first, have faith in God's provided means, and then after they look, and then afterwards they had to perform the work of looking so that God could perform the work of healing and curing. The same thing is true of Jesus being look, uh, lifted up on the cross. In order for humanity to experience salvation, they first of all have to believe God's word through his prophets. Then, once they believe God's word through his prophets, they have to look to Jesus, who was God's provided and chosen means of, of, uh, of giving salvation to humanity. And it's not just enough that, that people believe, they have to look to Jesus. They have to rely on him, not just with word, not just with uh, a head knowledge, but with action. So, what I'm basically saying here is that faith is demonstrated in the action of looking. One couldn't say, oh, I have faith, I totally believe, but not look. See, it'd be one thing if you were unable to look. But if you, if, you, if you have the ability to look, and you say that you have the faith, but you refuse to look, how much faith do you really have? So, all these people were saved through faith, trusting in God's provided means. And because of that faith, they looked to the serpent, 
uh, to the bronze serpent that was lifted up and they were healed. In the same way today, as we, by faith, trust in what God has said, and we look to Jesus, we are provided with healing, with salvation, with purpose, and with meaning in life. So these lessons and symbols basically have something in common. All right? Uh, we talked first about uh, the Cain and Abel incident in Genesis chapter 4, and how God had respect to Abel's gift but not to Cain's, and how Abel's represented righteousness by faith, whereas Cain's represented righteousness by works. And then we have, in this case, the situation where the, serp the bronze serpent is lifted up in the wilderness on a pole. And anybody who looks to it would be saved. So anybody who looked at that bronze serpent would have life and would have cure from their diseases. What do these two symbols of the bronze serpent and the sacrifices of Cain and Abel have in common? And what are they trying to teach us? What are your thoughts? Uh, well, it's, it's saying that salvation is only through Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bring you to a, a text in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and it says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. So mm -hmm. salvation is only through Christ. And uh, the bronze serpent lived up in the wilderness. That was a symbol of Christ. And also, the Abel's sacrifice was symbolic of Christ. Hmm. Amen. I think that that uh, is right along with what I was thinking. And I, I think that I want to add to that, that both of these ideas deal with, first of all, providing a means of salvation or providing a means of acceptance that is outside of humanity. In the first case, the life and death of an animal, the blood of an animal, had to be a substitute for man's sins and only through a means outside of the man himself could acceptance or forgiveness or salvation be provided. In the second instance, one had to look to something that was outside of themselves, looking up to this, to this bronze safe, uh, serpent that was put on a pole uh, would give a person curing and salvation. And if you didn't look up to something outside of yourself, you uh, could not receive that salvation or that or that healing. So it shows us in both instances that, hum that humanity has to look outside of themselves for what they can't provide for themselves. Only God can provide salvation. So we must look outside of ourselves to be reconciled to God. Also, I think to a larger extent, it deals with the substitutionary atonement that Jesus provides. The, the, the animal had to die in the place of Abel, offering its blood on behalf of Abel's blood in order for Abel to be accepted, representing how Christ had to die on behalf of man in order for humanity to be reconciled to God. It's only by the, by the blood of Christ that we can have uh, salvation and uh, be reconciled to, to a holy God. And with the bronze serpent being lifted up in the wilderness... It's only by looking to what's outside of ourselves. Um, the bronze serpent, uh, when you look to it, would provide healing and, and restoration because of the faith that one had uh, in, in God's chosen method of providing that healing. So no matter how many cures you went to, no matter how many doctor visits you went to, if you were bitten by one of those serpents, you were dead. No matter how many antidotes you took, no matter what you did, you were finished. But by looking to what was outside of yourself, by looking to God's chosen means uh, of providing salvation, we saw that something substituted for man's sins. So Moses stood in the place of, of the people and prayed for them, and then God provided this means uh, of giving them salvation. And as we look at um, what Christ does, as he's lifted up, he's our sacrifice, he is the one who dies in the place of humanity so that humanity can be reconciled to God. So both symbols represent the, the, the death um, and, uh, and atoning blood of Christ and what that does on behalf of humanity. And it's only by placing faith in that thing, uh, only by, by placing faith in what Christ has done, that anyone can be saved. So it wasn't like, see, a lot of times people get these things wrong. They look at symbols as the end-all, be-all. And they look at the symbols as having power within themselves. 
the symbol of, of the bronze serpent really didn't mean anything. I, I mean, not that it didn't mean anything. I, I rather, let me, let me rephrase that. The symbol of the bronze serpent really didn't have power within itself. It was because that bronze serpent represented an aspect of Christ that God used it as an instrument and a teaching tool to save the children of Israel. So in other words, just because you're sick and you put a bronze serpent on a pole and hold it up and look at it does not mean that you're going to be saved. Matter of fact, if the children of Israel had ever done that before this time or after that time, nothing would have happened. God used this instrument or this symbol at that particular time to teach them something. So the bronze serpent really has no power within itself. It doesn't really matter. The bigger picture was what the symbol was representing about Christ's ministry and, and what Christ would accomplish on behalf of humanity. Uh, the same thing is true of the sacrificial animal. So, you know, when you sacrifice an animal, the, the blood of the animal really had no power to cleanse from sin. And you read that in the book of Hebrews. Um, you know, the writer of Hebrews is very adamant about the fact that the blood of uh, bulls and goats and sheep and so forth really doesn't have any power to cleanse a person from their sin or provide life. The bigger picture is what those things represent uh, and how they show Christ's ministry uh, and what he would accomplish on our behalf. So sometimes in, in, in some uh, faiths, they get too caught up in the symbols that they miss the larger point. The symbols are really useless, except when they're being used to teach the larger point. So if we look at the symbols, instead of seeing the bigger picture, we've missed the point. Um, in Genesis, actually, no, I'm going to go to um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. So the point here is that both of these symbols that we saw in Genesis and also in um, uh the story of Exodus, were used to teach the idea of substitutionary atonement. But I want us to go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse 7. Which says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are, as, as ye are le unleavened. Sorry. Purge out the, therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So here you see how Christ was sacrificed, not for himself, but for us. His death was substitutionary for our death. Uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's according to Romans 6.23. So the wages of sin warrants death. And that's what humanity deserves. We deserve death. We inherit death uh, as a result of our sinful propensities, which we obtain from uh, Adam and Eve. But... The gift of God is eternal life. So because of what God has done uh, in sending Jesus as a gift to, to, to die substitutionary for our sins, we have everlasting life that really he deserves but gives to us. Uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Which says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So here we see that God formed man from the dust of the ground, he took the time, he put, he put his hands in the, in the dirt, he formed man from the dust of the ground, and then gave him life. And if you look at the language that's used here in God forming man, as opposed to speaking them into existence like he did everything else, God actually took, this, took his time and shaped and formed humanity. Um, and it's similar to how a potter tends to work with clay. Uh, God often uses this potter clay imagery or symbolism to describe his relationship with humanity. Let's take a look at, his, at, his, at an example of that in Jeremiah chapter 18. So we're going to look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 18, and uh, particularly verses 1 to 10, which says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then when I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight 
and it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So in this instance, we see this potter clay imagery or, or symbolism used where God says, just like, you, just like the clay is in the potter's hand, you people are in mine hand. And it's interesting that God formed man from the dust of the ground because just like how a potter forms and shapes clay into whatever image it wants, uh, he may want or she may want to uh, shape it into, God, uh, when he created humanity, formed and shaped man into his own image. And so he has power to do with humanity as he chooses, just like a potter has clay to do with, uh, to do with it as uh, the potter chooses. Let's go to uh, Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 16 for a moment, and we'll see some more imagery uh, re regarding clay and, and the potter uh, used. Uh, Isaiah chapter 29 verse 16 says, Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? Now, how insulted would you be if you were making something, perhaps of clay or whatever the material might be, and then after you got finished making it, it said, man, you don't know what you're doing. You have no understanding. I mean, for the thing formed to say to who formed it that they don't have understanding is ridiculous because when you form and when you create something, you make it for a purpose. And so you are the one who has the understanding and the thing formed cannot say to its creator, what are you doing? You have no understanding. And worse yet, God makes this case where he says, um, shall the thing formed say to him who made it, you didn't make me. But yet, I mean, imagine building a computer and then the computer says, no, you didn't make me, somebody else did. Or imagine making a, uh, a Lego castle or something and then after you finish making the Lego castle, the Lego castle says, no, you didn't make me, somebody else did. And of course, these things can't, can't talk. You know, we're doing a little bit of personification here. But in this case, humanity can talk and humanity that was made by God says, he made me not. So God uses the imagery of clay saying to the potter, you didn't make me, to illustrate the absurdity of humanity saying that God is not their creator. The thing formed can't say to the creator, you didn't make me, you didn't have any understanding. But yet that's exactly what humanity is doing today. And we do it all the time, especially uh, on the subject of evolution. If you really think about it, evolution is exactly what this text is referring to. Because evolution is man's way of saying, no, God didn't make me. God doesn't have any understanding. But yet it is God who created us. And uh, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 9. So we're going to Isaiah 45 and verse 9, which says, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or thy work he hath no hands. So imagine something that you spend your hard, you know, your, your, your time with and really, you know, working hard at it and you create it and you make it just the way you want it. And then it turns around and says, You didn't have any understanding. What are you doing, man? What are you making? And begins to question you as its creator. Uh, computers do that all the time. You know what it's called? A virus. So when your computer begins to question what you're doing and it comes up with all these error messages, that means that there's something wrong with the computer, not something wrong with the maker. So humanity is absurd in asking God, what are you doing? Or, you know, what are you making? You don't have hands. But yet that's exactly what we do. And God uses this imagery or the symbolism of the potter and the clay to illustrate that point. Let's go to Isaiah uh, chapter 64 and verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay thou, and thou art the potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. So here, uh, Isaiah seems to rightly attribute the relationship between potter and clay. Uh, the clay is the handiwork of the potter, just like humanity is the handiwork of God. Uh, last text we're going to go to is uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 18 to 21 on this subject. So Romans chapter 9, uh, verse 18 to 21. And um, we did look a little bit at this uh, when we read the uh, memory text earlier, but now we're going to read it in its, in its context. Uh, so verse 18 says, 
Therefore hath, the, hath, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will hard, uh, and on whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and the other, and another unto dishonor? So here again, we see this potter and clay imagery, which God uses to illustrate that just as we, as, uh, or anybody who does pottery, ha has uh, power over the clay to do with it as they choose, so humanity in the hand of God, uh, God has the power and the right to do whatever he chooses with, uh, with his handiwork. And so, uh, you know, just like the clay can't resist and protest and say, no, you can't make me like that, or no, you have to, you have to create me this way, you know, we can't then say to God, no, you, you, you can't do it that way. you got to do it this way, the way that we tell you to do it. God has power over humanity, just like the potter has power over the clay. Um, and we need to recognize God's sovereignty. So the imagery and symbolism of the potter and the clay teach us the sovereignty of God. Uh, as a potter is sovereign over the clay uh, and, and what he chooses to do with it, he does with it. So God is sovereign over humanity and can do as he pleases with humanity. Uh, people can choose to make wrong decisions and they can choose to do bad things all they want. But uh, this doesn't change the fact that God is sovereign over everything. Uh, he is ultimately in control over the whole world. Um, and ultimately, we know, according to Scripture, he will triumph in the end. And regardless of how things look now, we can trust that God is going to um, override everything and work everything out to the benefit of those who love him. So God permits things uh, to be allowed to result from human choices. He permits things to uh, occur for now. But ultimately, he's in control of everything and has the power to right every wrong and to restore um, all that's been lost as a result of the sin problem. So everything that happens, happens as a result of God allowing it to happen. So God doesn't want it to happen, but he allows it to happen uh, so that he can show humanity uh, that he is sovereign and that ultimately the claims that Satan made against him in the great controversy are false. So regardless of the way that things look now, we must remember that even though God may allow certain things to happen for a purpose, remember it's always for a purpose, it's not just allowing it to arbitrarily happen for no reason. God allows things to happen for a purpose. And even though he allows them to happen for a purpose, um, he will one day right every wrong and triumph in the end. Um, as we look throughout the Bible, we see texts that show us God's sovereignty. For example, when you look at uh, the, the book of Daniel, you'll see, for example, that um, God is sovereign over kingdoms. So regardless of who comes into power and who does what while they're in power, God is ultimately in control uh, of the kingdoms, uh, of the kingdoms of the earth, rather. And so one day God will set up an everlasting kingdom, but for now he has permitted the kingdoms that reign on earth to exist. But that doesn't mean that God is not in control. God is completely in control and can set up kingdoms and tear them down as he chooses. So we shouldn't confuse God's, um, God allowing things to go a certain way for a period of time uh, with the idea that he's not sovereign. He allows it for a purpose, but ultimately he has the control uh, and will exercise that control at the appointed time. So from the book of Daniel, for example, we learn that God will one day set all things right. The next thing I want to talk about is um, how this relates to Jeremiah. So let's look at some more symbolism in the book of Jeremiah. We've looked at the potter and clay imagery that was in uh, the book of Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Romans. But now we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 19, and we're going to look at um, the kingdom of Judah. All right, so before we get into the symbolism that, that, that's used here, let's first set the stage. So there were many evils that had overtaken the kingdom of Judah. And we read about them in Jeremiah chapter 19, uh, particularly in verse 4, which says, Because they have forsaken me, and have estranged this place, and have burned incense in it unto other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of innocents. They have built also the high places of Baal and uh, to, turn their, uh, to, to burn their sons with fire, for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. So here in verse 4 and 5, we get a, an idea of the depravity 
that uh, was taking place. I see that we got a comment coming in by uh, webcam. God wants to shape us into his image by the cross. See Galatians 2.20. Amen. That's right. Um, God does want to shape us back into his image, and that was the image that was lost in, uh, uh, you know, in the fall after uh, Adam and Eve had sinned. And it's very important. God wants us to understand that just like, see, the, the potter and clay imagery is not just about God being creator in the, in the sense that he can form man from the dust of the ground and create him. But also as the potter, he can fix the things that are wrong with us as a result of the sin problem. And because of the fact that God can fix those problems in us, um, he's telling us that just like uh, the clay is in the potter's hand, he, we are in his hand. And because we are like clay in his hand, uh, the sins that are within us, the, the problems that we have, the disease, the, the, uh, the death, um, the, uh, you know, the mental health issues, all the things that can go wrong with humanity are fixable by God. And God will set all things right. And he will restore us into the image of God. Now, going back to Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 4, we saw how uh, God says here, because they have forsaken me and have estranged this place and have burned incense in it unto other gods whom they whom neither they nor their fathers have known nor kings nor the kings of Judah and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. So we see here uh, an idea of what's going on. Uh, they were worshiping other gods. Uh, they were slaughtering innocent people. Uh, they were offering their children in the fire to false gods. Uh, they were doing all kinds of crazy things. And so much so that God uses this term that they had estranged this place. Now, uh, it's a little debatable as to whether he's talking specifically about the temple or all of Jerusalem. But in either case, they had made it strange to God. So when God uses this term, estranged this place, uh, he, may, he, he uses a, a, a Hebrew uh, wording that suggests that it was foreign to him. It was strange. They had profaned it. So it seems to indicate that it's no longer recognizable as what God had originally purposed it to be. So the nation was supposed to be a holy nation. They were supposed to be a holy people. They were supposed to represent God. Let's go to Exodus chapter 5 and verse, uh, sorry, Exodus chapter 19 for a moment. And we're looking at uh, verses 5 and 6, which says, Now therefore, if you, will, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be a, unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So as you can see here, Israel was designed to be a chosen people. They were a kingdom of priests. They were a holy nation. But they had gotten so wicked in the things that they were doing that God said, you have estranged this place. You've made it unrecognizable. You profaned it. It's now strange to me. I don't recognize what I see. So through these actions that they were doing that we read about in Jeremiah 19.4, uh, their actions had caused them to lose their character. They were no longer, they no longer had the distinctiveness which set them apart from the other nations. So as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, they were supposed to represent God. But instead, we find that uh, they lost their distinctiveness. And this is a lesson to us because we, should, we shouldn't be afraid to be distinct and different from others, especially as we represent God. Uh, we're, if you're going to represent God, if you're going to stand up as a Christian, you're going to be different. You're going to stand out. But Israel, wanting so much, having so much influence from, from the surrounding nations, uh, they were so influenced by the culture around them, by the things that the, that the other uh, pagans were doing, that when they began to adopt their practices, they became estranged and alienated uh, from God. And so uh, their sins, uh, instead of allowing them to be distinct and to be able to be witnesses... Uh, they were being just like the rest of the world and lost that distinctiveness. And today, if we conform to the ways of the world, we too can lose our distinctiveness and we will no longer reflect and represent Christ. Uh, the, list of, the list of sins continues in verse 5, which I already read. Um, and I want to point out that particularly the human sacrifices were mentioned here, where the idea of human sacrifices was, uh, may have been known in the, in the ancient world, but it's something that God particularly abhorred and detested. And, it was, and because God abhorred and detested it, it was supposed to be abhorred and detested by the Israelites. Uh, just to give you a glimpse of what I'm talking about, we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 18 for a moment. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. 
So you would think that telling somebody not to cause their children to pass through fire in order to uh, appease some pagan god would be common sense. You know, when we look at that today, the idea that somebody would take their children and throw them in fire in order to appease some angry god or goddess is absurd to us. So imagine how that, how that kind of action must appear to a holy, righteous, and loving god. He was abhorred. He detested it. And these things uh, were, were given to them in the law so that, they know, so that they would know that they were supposed to be abhorred and detested by the children of Israel. But instead, they were adopting these very practices which should have baffled them, which should have like, just you know, knocked them off their feet and said, what are these people doing? But instead, they were practicing it themselves because they wanted to be like everybody else and do what the pagans did instead of being distinct. But God said to this, God said to them, this isn't what I wanted. He says uh, specifically, neither came it into my mind. So in other words, not only don't I want it, this didn't come to my mind. I didn't even think about asking you to do this for me. I don't want this. So when he uses this phrase, neither came it into my mind, the Hebrew literally says, it did not rise up uh, on my heart. And this meant that the idea of throwing children into fire to appease an angry God was foreign to God's nature and far from his intentions. Uh, this practice was alien to God, yet the people had reached a level of perverseness that made them com uh, completely for uh, foreign to what God had intended them to be as a nation of priests, and a, uh, sorry, as a kingdom of priests and a nation that was holy. Um, they were, like I said before, so influenced by the surrounding prevailing culture that they were blinded to this thing being sinful and abhorred by, uh, uh, by God and supposed to be abhorred by them. Uh, they, they were willing to accept the prevailing culture and uh, reject what God wanted, and, they, and they, 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 they didn't care so much about their connection with God. See, if they had been connected with God, if they had been reading and studying um, as they were supposed to, if they had memorized uh, you know, Deuteronomy 18.10, they would have known that this was not a practice that they were supposed to perform. But instead, uh, because they were so influenced and um, so susceptible or, or, sub or subject to the um, uh, influences of the, of the surrounding nations wanting to be like them, they ignored their relationship with God and did something that was completely foreign to what God would have wanted. And today, we can have the same problem. You see, prevailing culture often blinds humanity to such an extent that they're willing to accept almost any practice and do almost anything that should be foreign if they profess a knowledge of God. So anybody who's connected with God would not want to offer their children in the fire. They would have no desire to do so. They would have no inclination or, or um, uh, coercion or, or, or um, influence to do so. But when we're not connected with God, sometimes Satan fills us with other things because we, re we refuse to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so when we leave that kind of territory open for Satan, he'll fill us with things that God doesn't know and God doesn't want within us. And so in this instance, uh, the people, because they weren't in connection with God, were adopting these practices that they should have, uh, that they should have abhorred. And today, if we're not connected with God, what kinds of practices do we accept and do ourselves not realizing the full extent of our sin, blinded to the consequences and to um, what we're doing to our relationship with God. Are there practices today that we sometimes do that God abhors and God doesn't want, but yet because we've adopted the, surround, the culture of the surrounding people, uh, because we've adopted worldly practices, we still think it's okay. So this happens especially when we don't spend enough time with God to know his will. And if we don't fill ourselves with God, remember, Satan will, will be more than happy to go after that vacancy. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 for a moment. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So through exercising our spiritual senses, in other words, using the word of God, we strengthen our spiritual senses and we make them better able to discern good from evil. So if we, if we practice the word of God, if we spend time reading it and then we put it into practice, our senses will be exercised. See, the Bible contains the strong meat. 
This is God's word to us. That's what gives us the strong meat. And if we put it into practice and we exercise it, we'll be able to discern good and evil. But when we're at a disconnect with God, when we're not really reading and spending time in his word, and when we allow the prevailing cultures to fill, to fill us in the way that God should fill us, then we can be open to all kinds of crazy and sinful practices that God abhors and we should abhor also. So because of the apostasy in Judah, God sends Jeremiah to perform uh, a symbolic act. And we find that in Jeremiah chapter 19. We already read uh, verses 1 to 5. I'm going to just start with verse 6. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of, of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. And I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of them that seek their lives. And their carcasses will I give to be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city desolate and an hissing. Everyone that passes, by, uh, that passes thereby shall be astonished and hiss because of all the, the plagues of, of the, because of all the plagues thereof. And I will cause them to eat, of, eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat every one the flesh of his friend and the, in the siege and straightness. Therewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. Then shalt thou break the bottle in the, sight of the, in the sight of the men that go with thee, and shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city as one that breaketh a potter's vessel, that cannot be made whole again. And they shall bury them in Tophet, till there be no place to bury. Thus will I do to, unto this people, saith the Lord, and to the, the, the inhabitants thereof. And even make this city as Tophet. And the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled as the place of Tophet, because of the houses upon whose roofs they have burned incense unto all the hosts of heaven, and have poured out drink offerings unto other gods. Then came Jeremiah from Tophet, whither the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon this city and upon all her towns all the evil that I have pronounced against it, because they have hardened their, their necks that they might not hear my words. Now, if you took a, a particular look at verse 10, notice that Jeremiah was carrying a, a bottle or a jar or a flask which he got from the potter, and God commanded him to break it in the sight of the people. So first of all, God wanted witnesses there to see Jeremiah do this. And these, these witnesses that were going to be there were the very priests, elders, and leaders uh, that were responsible for all this corruption in Judah. And Jeremiah was to take this flask or this jar and break it in the sight of the people to represent um, the finality of God destroying uh, this city and, and the inhabitants because of the sins that they were committing. So the smashing of the jar uh, was different from simply just cracking it. See, if you crack a jar, you can still use it. It still has some use to it. But when you break it and you shatter it, it was good for nothing, and it, had, it would have become useless. And this represented the shattering judgment that God was going to send on Judah, uh, rendering them basically good for nothing because of the things that they had done. So God uses the language here of irreparable damage uh, to warn them ahead of time that judgment was coming as a result of the things that they had done. So again here, we see how a jar is used to symbolize how God was going to judge them. Yet the people chose not to hear this warning. Uh, the depth of their depravity can best be understood by the depth of the punishment that warranted uh, the, the response to this type of depravity. So in other words, their sins were so bad that it warranted a severe judgment so that it could... Um, so what do you hear? So that, so that it could respond appropriately to the level of sins that they had committed. The last thing I want to talk about uh, is a symbol that's used in Jeremiah chapter 13, verses uh, 1 to 11, which is a linen belt. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of it, but Jeremiah was told to obtain a sash and to hide it uh, in a rock for several days. But by the time he was commanded to go obtain it, uh, the sash or the belt that he had was useless and spoiled. Uh, it was probably destroyed uh, by the exposure to the elements from within the rock. <clears throat> God warned that he would cause the people to be spoiled just as this sash or this belt had become useless. And a lot of scholars sometimes would debate about whether it was really the, the river Euphrates that, Je that Jeremiah went to. 
because uh, the, the river Euphrates was about a four months journey, according to Ezra 7, 9, uh, in, order to, in order to get there, if you were going in only in one direction. So some scholars kind of disagree with the idea that the Euphrates River was being referred to uh, because it would be several hundred kilometers from Jerusalem. Uh, and Jeremiah was told to go back and forth twice. So it's argued that because of the long distance, it's impossible Jeremiah probably wasn't going to that particular location. And it's not the only possible interpretation for this text. However, another way of looking at it is that this long distance that Jeremiah would have had to travel could have been symbolic for how far away the Israelites and the, Ju and the people of Judah were going to go in their Babylonian captivity. Um, or Israel also being uh, captive to the Assyrians and then uh, Judah going into captivity to the Babylonians. And it was going to be a far away captivity. And so um, perhaps God had them travel such a long distance to represent the farness of their captivity. And also another thing that we can add to that is that such a long trip would have given Jeremiah an understanding of the joy that the children of Israel, or rather the children of Judah, would have experienced coming back from the Babylonian captivity after 70 years of hardship. So the long trip, you know, Jeremiah being wearied and tired and finally getting a chance to rest when he returned home uh, would have represented the children of Israel coming back uh, to uh, the land of Judah uh, after such a long um, captivity of 70 years. And when I said uh, children of, of Israel there, I'm talking about... Uh, the um, the Jewish people who were in captivity to the Babylonians for 70 years. So sometimes the Bible uses children of Israel and Judah interchangeably, as I just did there. Um, anyway, the belt represented Israel and Judah. Uh, when it was first purchased, it was pure and it was um, unstained. It was, it was great. It was uh, something that the wearer, the man wearing it, would actually wear um, around his waist and would uh, represent... And that, and that person would represent God himself. So the, the, the belt represented Israel and Judah, and the man wearing the belt represented God, who was wearing an unstained and pure sash. The belt was made of linen, which was the material that the priest's garments were supposed to be made of. For example, if you look at Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 4, you'll see that the um, linen cloth was often used for the priest's garments. Judah was supposed to be the priestly nation, as we as we read in uh, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6. So just as the belt was ruined, the pride of Judah, the pride of the nations, would also be ruined. Uh, just like they were at one time pure and became ruined and stained, Judah and Israel were at one time pure and became stained and um, unusable um, with irreparable damage as a result of their sins. Uh, and because of this uh, ruin and tarnish that happened to the belt, it was now unwearable. And so uh, the surrounding elements that had ruined the sash was representative, uh, or symbolic rather, of how the surrounding nations, or the influence of the surrounding nations, had ruined the usefulness of God's chosen people. If we take a look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 11 and Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, verse 5 to 8, let's just go there really quickly. We're going to do a little bit of compare and contrast. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 11, I'm oh, sorry, chapter 13 and verse 11, which says, <clears throat> For as the girdle cleaveth to the lion, to, sorry, to the loins of a man, uh, for as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for praise and for glory but they would not hear. So here God says that uh, the kingdom of, of, of Judah and the house of Israel were supposed, to be, were supposed to cleave to him. They were supposed to be a part of him uh, in the sense that they're, that they're on him like how a man wears a sash. They were supposed to be with him, but yet they had departed. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 for a moment. We're going to start at verse uh, 5, which says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that, they, that ye should do so in the land whither, whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is, is in all things 
that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? So here we see that God's people were privileged. Uh, they, had, they had such righteous commandments and a strong relationship with God that they were supposed to be envied by the other nations. God was near to them just like the wearer of the sash had the sash near to, to, the, to the person wearing it. Um, so just like a person would have a, a sash that they're wearing and it's, and it's cleaving to them, it's on them, God's people were to be that connected with God. Today, we need to know that God is near to us and we need to be connected with God. Now, although we have all these symbols throughout Scripture, we covered some of them tonight, but now we've run out of time, uh, we don't know or understand everything about every symbol in the Bible. Our perspective is therefore limited. Um, and the lesson brings out this idea of a self-referential problem, which basically means that when reason gets entangled within itself, it's hard to get anything reasonable out of it. Um, and so it ceases to conform to our understanding because we can't get anything reasonable out of it. If we, get, uh, if, we, if we can't untangle human reasoning, then how do we expect to be able to untangle the mysteries of God in, in these symbols that are throughout Scripture? Uh, especially when, as we're trying to study God's dealings with humanity, we have a very limited perspective. We don't know everything. But because of the cross, we have a strong reason to trust that God uh, is, doing, is working on our behalf in spite of what we don't know. So we don't know everything. We're not going to be able to understand every single symbol all the time. But in spite of what we don't know, we can still trust in what God has done for us and what God will do for us because we know and we can trust God as a result of what he demonstrated about his love and his character on the cross. So God gives us symbols so that we can study and uncover more and more truth. And what we don't know we can trust that God will work out to our benefit in the long run. So that's all the, the time that we have uh, tonight. There's so much more detail that we could have gotten into with this lesson, but unfortunately we have to, uh, to close out. So let's just end this with a word of prayer that God will continue to bless us as we study these symbols throughout Scripture and understand how they apply to our lives and how uh, God is working for the benefit of humanity to save them into his everlasting kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing in studying your word and looking at some of the symbolism in, the, in Scripture that we may understand how you are saving us and the things that you're doing on our behalf. We thank you, Father, for these symbols, and we pray that you would help us and bless us as we study them, that we may draw closer to you and be warned of the things that are to come, that we may have opportunity to, to walk with you, and that we may be saved when you come to take us to your glorious kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Good night.